I, uh, last week with the Beatitudes, I knew what I was going to preach on for, for weeks. I was so excited about that message. And I also knew for weeks that I really didn't know where to take this next chunk. And, and uh, I was trying to keep it really light and simple because Christ is talking here how he wants his people to behave. But there's a lot going on here, and there's a lot of, uh, well, Christians are coming at this from different points of views, and there's a lot of issues here. And I kind of was feeling like if I just ignored it all or skipped it all or circumvented it, that a lot of you would feel a little bit cheated maybe uh, because we really do need to deal with some of these things. So it, it wasn't until last night uh, that I decided, okay, I can't dodge it, we've got to just go right into it and, uh, and tackle what the text has for us today. So, uh, boy, I want to say so it's not my fault, but it kind of really is, isn't it? So, isn't it a bummer when you want to blame somebody else and you can't? So, no, this is the message I prepared. And so I, I would like to encourage all of you, it's foggy, it's, uh, oh man, Steve, you're my hero, buddy. It's foggy. Uh, some of you work the night shift, and uh, it's daylight savings time, and uh, and this is a difficult message. So let's just really ask God right now that we need something supernatural to keep us awake this morning. So let's let's pray and ask God to do something to keep us awake. Let's pray. Lord God, here we are. We came because we want to receive from you. It's harder to do that when we're asleep. So, Lord, please help us to stay awake. We're going to be studying your word today. Help us to focus on that. Lord God, do something miraculous this morning and keep us all focused. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Uh, we're in Matthew chapter 5. This morning we're going to continue our study of the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is easily one of the most popular sections in, in the entirety of Scripture. And that's really weird because, again, it's one of the most theologically complex. Uh, people quote from the Sermon on the Mount all the time. Christians, non-Christians, quote from the Sermon on the Mount all the time. Gandhi loved uh, Christ's a message here, a Sermon on the Mount. Uh, the early church fathers, the first, second, third, fourth, you know, the first couple hundred years of Christian teachers quoted from chapters 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew, before they were labeled 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew, they quoted from this section of Scripture more than any other place. Three times more than, than the uh, preceding chapters combined is what one scholar I read had to say. The things Christ has to say here are uh, incredibly revolutionary, as we saw last week. We, we need to get out of this. The greatest enemy, we said last week, the greatest enemy from understanding the scripture is familiarity. You've read it. You've heard it so many times before. We forget how radical, how different, how, how even bizarre, countercultural, counterintuitive, radical uh, the things that Christ was saying truly are. Christ was saying the way you think it's okay to behave it isn't. And even this week, I'm studying scholars, even Christian scholars, who are looking at this passage and saying, now here's why Christ isn't really saying what it looks like he's saying. And to me, that raises a big red flag. If, if I'm reading this trying to make excuses for why, it looks to me like the Holy Spirit dodged sometimes. God's trying to intersect me, and I'm moving off the side so, it, so that he misses me. Who? Whew. Holy Spirit didn't get me that time. Otherwise, I might have had to change my attitudes and my actions. This passage, though, is really hard. It's very difficult. The church fathers, and, and I was kind of comforted because I was looking at this, and I thought nobody's really coming at it the way I wanted to come at it, which is also... Not a good thing, really. People ask me when I planted foundation, uh, what kind of church are you? And I'd say, and they say, well, what makes you different? And I, I would always say, 
Not much, I hope. You know, we, we want to be a Bible church. We're not doing anything radically or new. Uh, so when I was reading this, I was at first not finding a lot of scholars that were saying, and then I started to see that, that scholars have been saying this, including right from the very beginning. Uh, maybe different scholars seeing different parts of it. Uh, the early church fathers saw this passage as Christ saying that he would fulfill the Old Testament law. So we have the law of Moses, and, and then we have the moral code that predates the law of Moses. We have all of this law in the Old Testament. And the early church fathers saw Christ is saying he's going to fulfill the law. And then the Catholic Church had a similar view, but they thought, strangely at that time, uh, that this passage was only meant for like saints and priests and super-Christians. Because it's so difficult, how could that be meant for everybody? Then the Reformation came, and they correctly said that this is for everybody. Christ is setting a very high bar here, but they didn't see it as Christ fulfilling the law. They saw it as Christ abrogating the law. In other words, Christ comes, and he's setting aside the law. The law is no longer, no longer valid. And, and so I was with, actually, the early church fathers on this one. This is Christ, I think. And again, we have a church where you're free not to agree with the pastor. We've said that from day one. I, in fact, I gave a sermon once that said, don't trust your pastor, check it with scripture. Today's a difficult section. You can think different than me, that's okay. And as I've said before, someday we'll get to heaven and you'll find out I was right. So, <laughs> so it's okay for us to have a difference of opinion here. And honestly, I want to say, I'm doing the best I can, and, and if I miss it, I, I'm very sorry for that. I prayed, and, and I'm hoping the Holy Spirit's working, and I, and I really want to get this right, but I understand that there's people smarter than me who are com, coming in different angles on this. And so, and so maybe, maybe I just don't think that way because I didn't understand it. That's really possible. So the Reformation guys, which were big, big brain guys, said Christ is coming to set aside the law, the early church said Christ is coming to fulfill the law, which is said in this passage. And I kind of think, honestly, that's what's happening right here. And I hope you're able to track with me and see how that comes out later. Uh, <clears throat> but one thing that we could all get out of this, unless you're a medieval Catholic scholar, is that Christ is calling us not just priests, not just saints, not just super Christians, not just monks. Christ is calling everybody to think differently, and to act differently. <clears throat> this is radical faith part three, how does Jesus want me to live? The answer, probably different than you are. That's true of me. <clears throat> Reading this passage, <clears throat> incredibly hard. I'm reading this, and I, I have to teach on this, and there's only one way I can teach on it, by telling you up front, I fail again and again and again. I'm looking at this, and I mean even this week, I failed to have attitude towards stuff and material things in our time life on this earth to think the way Christ wants me to think. And so Christ is setting it up here. But I'm, some people take that and say, well, if it's so far up there, what good is it? Don't you? I take an opposite effect. I take an opposite way of thinking about that. I'm so glad that the things God calls me to are higher than the mess in Dan Wolf's heart. I'm so glad that God has set for me something beautiful and noble and good up there. And he says, now, Dan, live that way. And I say, God, thank you that your ways are better than my ways. So I don't look at this and say, oh, that's too difficult. It's impossible. What's the good of it? I say, that is so good because God calls me out of myself. And as a church, let it call us out of ourselves because the way the world lives is a dead end. And God is calling us to something better. And it's bigger than me. And it's bigger than you. And that's a good thing. Uh, so I was with the early church on, on that respect, that they saw a crisis fulfilling the law, but they saw this sermon then as intended for people who are already Christians. Isn't that an interesting perspective? They were already Christians, and they read this and saying, oh, this can't be about salvation because it looks like works-oriented. And we have this idea of works versus law. As they said, so this must be intended for people that are already saved by grace. How should they act? And I, I agree with them. This is how we should act. 
But the funny thing is, in that case, the real audience was not the thousands of people Christ spoke to. They were just witnesses. And if that's the case, the real audience was Christ intending those people would believe in him in the future, looking back, would see it. Now, obviously, we're part of the audience, but was this Sermon on the Mount really not intended for the people who were there at that time? So I kind of take issue with the church fathers on that one, uh, and we're going we're gonna to talk about that uh, a little bit later. But Calvin believed, and he was a Reformationalist, and whenever you can agree with Calvin, I like that. Uh, I don't always agree with Calvin. Calvin, though, believed that the Sermon on the Mount actually had the salvation message right in there. It looks, if you just read it quick, it looks like works righteousness. Calvin didn't see it that way, and neither do I. If, we, if you look at it, and I said, please read 5, 6, and 7 at home as homework, so you get the whole big picture, I'm not, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but you can still do it this week if you didn't yet. Look at the totality of this, five, chapters 5, 6, and 7. You will see the gospel right there. And so I'm with Calvin on this one. Christ was not only saying, Christ was basically saying, okay, if, here's what my followers look like. They believe these things, and here's how they act. And this is the path to salvation and the path for how we should live our lives. Uh, so again, I was with the, the uh, church fathers in one respect and not with the Reformation, Reformation leaders, and I was with at least Calvin because some of the church uh, Reformationalists agreed with the church fathers on that one. So it's kind of a... a around the, you know, going around here. But many modern scholars, here's something interesting and, and crazy and wrong. You notice I was a little more careful with the Reformation guys and I was a little more careful with the church fathers. Modern scholars, I'm not as careful with. They're wrong. Many modern scholars teach this passage as being pre-Pauline. In other words, this is, a, this is an ancient form of Christianity that comes before grace. And they say Jesus was teaching you can only go to heaven if you're morally perfect. And that's bogus. That's, I don't need the books of Paul. I could just read the Sermon on the Mount and see that they don't know what they're talking about. So modern scholars who say this is pre-Pauline, this is an older version of Christianity, and, and then many times they'll say Jesus disagrees with Paul, and the two are in conflict. Jesus is teaching that you go to heaven if you're really good, and Paul talks about grace and, and, and salvation and all these other things. Uh, this is actually the main view of liberal scholars today. If you go to a liberal seminary, uh, if you turn on the television most times, uh, and they have a speaker or a guest speaker there, somebody wants to talk about the Bible, uh, they're going to say that Paul and Jesus are disagreement that the Sermon on the Mount does not fit with the rest of Scripture, and I do not buy that at all. Not at all. As we saw last week in the Beatitudes, there's nothing there that disagrees or contradicts Paul's letters. But it gets tricky, because there's some conservative scholars that actually take a similar view. Isn't that funny? That conservative scholars would say this disagrees with Paul. This is out of step with the rest of Scripture. Uh, but there's another problem with this theory. Chronologically, who came first, Jesus or Paul? Jesus. Jesus, amen. But almost all scholars believe that Paul wrote, planted the churches and wrote his letters to the churches very early, very early after the death of, and resurrection of Christ and before the book of Matthew was written. Isn't that interesting? If Paul was out there planting churches and writing his letters, that would mean that that was the first printed version of Christianity and not Matthew. If Matthew was writing it and everybody already had Paul's letters, why would he have written it differently? So I really uh, don't think that that's a good theory, and you're going to see why as we go through. This is not works righteousness Nobody can go to heaven based on their works because nobody is good enough. And we saw that right away last week. If you were here last week, you saw that. Uh, but as I said, many conservative uh, covenant and also dispensationalist theologians have a similar idea that maybe, this is bizarre, if you're not familiar with these terms, dispensations, dispensation, that God at different times in history dispensed his grace in different ways, that he, he approached humanity in different ways, or covenant theology, 
that, that there's a different, there's an Old Testament covenant and New Testament covenant, and right now Christ is talking in an Old Testament sense. So they actually end up in a similar place to the liberal scholars in saying that maybe Christ is speaking to the Jews under the Old Covenant, so this really isn't for us. Because he's talking to them in an Old Testament sense, and, and that's why it seems to contradict Paul's teaching on grace. And I, and I don't buy that either. And we're going to get to that as we go. You're going to see that there's nothing here about works righteousness. In fact, I see the Sermon on the Mount is like this, this nuclear bomb on human self-righteousness. The Sermon on the Mount goes right after the idea that we could be good enough on our own and just blows it to pieces. Nobody who's honestly letting this text say what it says is going to get out of there feeling like, hey, I'm pretty good. I dare you to be honest with this text and read it and say, you know what? I think I measure up. I don't need that grace thing. I'm going to be okay. Jesus Christ takes that apart. And nobody being fair with this text will say this is about works righteousness. It isn't, and it can't be. And incidentally, by the way, when we went through taking five plus years in the Old Testament, that wasn't about works righteousness either. It's always been throughout the entire Bible grace, and we saw that each and every week that we were studying through the Old Testament. Okay, today's date is March 10th. We're here Sunday, March 10th, 2013. Beautiful, foggy day out. It's, it's nice and warm. feels like spring. But I want you to imagine right now, go back almost 2,000 years to between the year 40 and the year 60, probably when Matthew was written in that time range. You're in a house church. There's not a fancy building. There's no stained glass windows. There's not a steeple. Uh, it's just the homes of one of the wealthier believers, probably. They've opened up their home. Very likely it's packed there this morning in that beautiful small location, packed. You're, you're like sardines. I've seen pictures of house churches in China where the people are just row to row and people outside the windows, and I've seen this in, in Africa too, and people are outside the doors leaning in, and, and it's just... It's, I'd rather have a small building packed out than a big building that echoes, right? So you're in, it's the year between 20, 40 and 60 A.D. You're in a house church, and you're hearing the book of Matthew read to you for the very first time. You're hearing, you, maybe you heard about the Sermon on the Mount, but Matthew, you're getting his perspective on it now. You're hearing this written document from one of Christ's followers for the very first time, but now I want you to imagine that you're in that ch ancient church. You're hearing Matthew being read for the first time. And imagine that you're, ima you're, so you're in the church and you're imagining while you're in the church that as the book is being read, you imagine that you're a Jew of 10 to 20 years prior who had heard Christ speaking as he gave the Sermon on the Mount. So you're with me? Today you're in 2013. You're imagining back to the year 40 or 60. And you're imagining like 10 or 20 years before that that you're Jewish. So now you're Jewish and you're, you're uh, on the mount, mountainside, and Christ is up on the hill, and he's, sit, he's seated. Uh, teachers would sit down. That's not a bad idea, by the way. Uh, teachers would sit down to preach, and, uh, and so you're there hearing the Sermon on the Mount in person. Well, actually, you're here, but you're imagining you were there. That was also imagining you were there. So uh, keep in mind that... Uh, this morning, we have the entire New Testament, which is an incredible, incredible gift from God. Uh, the you, back in the church, listening to the book of Matthew being read, didn't have the entire New Testament yet. But your church very probably had many of the letters of Paul already, so you're familiar with the letters of Paul as you're hearing the Gospel of Matthew being read. While you're sitting on the hillside listening to Jesus, that you didn't even know who Paul was. Everybody with me? That's the context. The people listening to Jesus didn't know he would get crucified. They didn't know the resurrection was coming. They didn't know that the followers of Jesus Christ would be scattered by persecution, but they'd go across the known world, even as far as China, in a few years making disciples everywhere they went. You're just simply sitting on the hillside listening to this young, radical teacher trying to figure out, who is this guy? And, and what does he want me to do? You're not thinking about covenants. Uh, you're not thinking about dispensationalism. You're not thinking about antinomian, oh, antinomianism, 
which is the idea that the law doesn't apply to Christians, which is another big controversy in this section. You're not thinking about any of that. You're trying to figure out who is this teacher and what does he want me to do? And that's the perspective I want us to approach this with. Have you ever heard people say that uh, they had God's law in the Old Testament, but we don't have to worry about that anymore? And, and sometimes maybe people act like as if they're free to do whatever they want, which incidentally, because of free will and, and God's general grace, you are free to do whatever you want. But then they think, and God will be pleased with it, but that's not true. We're free to do whatever we want, but that doesn't mean God's going to be happy with all of our choices. If you're one of those people who thought that God's moral rules and regulations were for the Old Testament Jews, but not for us today because Christ got rid of the law, you're really going to be in for a shock today. As we continue reading through the Sermon on the Mount, because the law, listen to this, and you've got to follow me. I told you this is complex. The law is still in effect today. We're a grace church. We preach grace all the time. The law is still in effect today. And if you leave right now and that's all you heard, you're going to be messed up. <laughs> so please stay awake and please st stay with me because the law is still in effect today. Jesus isn't going to tell us, uh, you don't have to obey God's moral rules anymore. Instead, Jesus amps up the pressure in the Sermon on the Mount. He actually makes the law much more difficult to obey. See, he could have said, don't worry about the law. It's going to be okay. I'll take care of everything. But instead, he explains the law in a way that makes it even more difficult for us to follow. Isn't that interesting? He tells us it's not enough to do the right things. We have to think the right things as well. Isn't that scary? Be honest with yourself. It's not enough just to bite your tongue when you want to say all that garbage. You're not even supposed to be thinking all that garbage. It's not enough not to just not commit adultery. We're not even supposed to be imagining adultery. It's not enough that you don't commit murder. It's, it, you're not even supposed to be thinking, oh, I'd like to, ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> right? Christ doesn't make it easy. The Sermon on the Mount wasn't supposed to be, so we could all sit back and say, <laughs> nice and comfortable. This Christianity stuff is easy. That's not what it's about. Christ doesn't comfort people by saying, don't worry about God's moral law. It doesn't apply to you. Instead, he explains that it's much harder to obey than you ever imagined. Then he's going to take it up a step and say, listen to this, you've got to be more righteous than the Pharisees. The really, really religious people you have to be more righteous than them. And then he drops this bomb on the people. He says, you have to be perfect like God is perfect. I don't know who's reading this and saying, oh, he's teaching if we're perfect, we go to heaven. He's teaching. What is Christ doing here? This is why, this is what the law requires. The law requires that I'm going to be perfect like God is perfect. And by the way, there's no provision for the past mistakes. If I made mistakes in the past, I'm still... So even if, hypothetically, I could be perfect from today, which is not true, not even close, I'd still be guilty of all my past sins. So I fail according to the law. According to the law, I am guilty. Guilty as charged. And I'm not going to come up in front of you and teach a nice little cutesy message that makes me feel good about myself. Look at how holy and spiritual I am. It makes you feel good, so good about yourself. Christ is blowing away the idea that we should be comfortable with how morally upright we are. Okay. Jesus Christ starts off, Jesus starts off by saying, uh, blessed or happy. Remember it in the, in the, in the uh, Beatitudes, the attitudes that should be. Blessed or happy or fortunate are those who understand their spiritual poverty. That's what the first line says. Blessed who are those who are poor in spirit. So God, God in flesh, comes down to earth. This is his first public sermon that's recorded. What does God have to say? He says, here, here's how to be happy. Isn't that beautiful? 
Isn't that so, so wonderful? God himself comes and says, here's how I want you to be happy. And he says, and it's going to start off with this. You've got to recognize you're poor in spirit. You've got to recognize you're spiritually bankrupt. You've got to recognize you're spiritually. Well, what does this mean? We're going to start the chapter. We're going to start chapter 5 by saying, blessed is the person who understands they're poor in spirit. And it's going to end by saying, and you have to be perfect like God is perfect. And both are true. Because the law requires perfection. And we dare not lower God's standard by saying, oh, I'm pretty good. I'm better than other people, so look at me. I'm good. What does that mean? We're elevating ourselves to the expense of lowering God's glory, lowering God's perfection. No, the law is perfect. And if you're going to go to heaven based upon your goodness, you better be perfect. There is no other option. Well, Christ starts off by saying, uh, there is no other option other than what God has provided. Christ starts off by saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. Okay, we're going to go back now and read from verse 1, and we're actually going to read most of this chapter. We need context, and we need the Beatitudes to be part of this entire discussion. And I hope you did your homework again reading 5, 6, and 7, because... Uh, some of this doesn't get resolved until chapter 6 and chapter 7. Okay, uh, Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to do 1 through 12 right now. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This message is a war on human righteousness. Christ starts off by saying, you're not righteous, and you're going to be happy once you get a hold of that. You have to understand you're broken, you're messed up, you're, spiritually, uh, you're in spiritual poverty. We need God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. In context, mourning our sin, uh, mourning the darkness within us. When, when we say things to our, our wife or our children we shouldn't have, we mourn it. When, when thoughts go on inside our mind that shouldn't and we're filled with lust or greed or, pi or pity parties or whatnot, we say, oh, why is this going on? And, and we mourn our fallenness. I want to be good. God said something so beautiful. I want to be that. And why am I so messed up? And we mourn. And Christ says, when you mourn like that, when you mourn your brokenness, you're going to be happy because you will be comforted. You're going to be comforted. God, we, think about it as parents. Think about it. When, when our kids do something wrong, now we can scold them and spank them and make them do the right thing, whatever. But when they, when they are broken, and say, I don't want to be like that. I don't want to tell lies anymore. I don't want to. When we see that our children are learning goodness, don't we love to see it? And God loves to see that in his children too. And he says, when you mourn your brokenness, you're going to be comforted. I'm going to comfort you. Blessed are the gentle, for they will inherit the earth. Not the violent, not the proud, not the bigger movers and shakers, not the famous, not those with the most money. Blessed are the gentle, for they will inherit the earth. And when we understand our own brokenness and we mourn our own sin, guess what? It's easier to be gentle with other people. Because when, when I understand Dan Wolf's brokenness, I'm much, more, much less likely to say, how dare you act like that to me? How dare you treat that? Oh, wait a second. How do I treat God? How have I treated other people? I see my sin, and it's so much easier for me then to be patient with other people. Amen? We see our brokenness, and it's easier to accept brokenness in other people. The gentle will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for goodness, for they will be satisfied. So when you get that feeling, oh, why? I want to be good, and I'm not, and, and you're being broken? Guess what? You will be. Because God started something in you, and he's going to finish it. And it's going to be okay. And I take great comfort in that. Because when I look here, I don't see hope. But I look at Jesus, and I find my hope. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have uh, been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of God. So now we're saying... Christ saying, if you follow me, if you obey me, you're going to be persecuted. Blessed are you when people insult you because of me and persecute you because of me and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice 
and be glad. Again, counterintuitive. For your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And then talking about people who see their brokenness and go to God and are learning to be uh, uh, peacemakers and learning to love others and learning about goodness and, and they're being persecuted for their... Talking about this group of people, Jesus says, you, my followers, who, who, who lived by... Uh, who are living by taking the Beatitudes to heart, you are the salt of the earth. Sometimes we say, is he talking about Christians? Is he talking about Jews? He's talking about the people that look like the Beatitudes we just read. My followers, you. Let's keep it simple. Let's stop bringing, importing theological questions from the 16th century. Let's just let it say what it says here. These people, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its tasteless, uh, becomes tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Uh, no longer good for anything. Christ is talking in this context of people who stood for him and are persecuted because of him. And if we're not living for Christ, we're good for nothing. God said that. Isn't that bizarre? I don't... I, that never hit me before that Jesus said, good for nothing. Uh, he's not talking about salvation. You know why I know that? Because he thinks he was, you are worth his blood. That has infinite value. But listen, brothers and sisters, if we live our life for greed, if we live our life bitter and angry, if we live our life pouting and feeling bad for ourselves, if we're always depressed, if, if we're living our lives and we're all wrapped up here, guess what? For sharing the kingdom, for winning people to Christ, if that's what I'm doing, I'm good for nothing. It's just the way it is. If I'm not bringing, uh, the, if I'm not bringing what we saw in, in the Beatitudes right there, if I'm not sharing this love and this gentleness and, with other people, I'm really not worth much for winning people to Jesus Christ. Verse 14, you... Again, you people who are living out the Beatitudes, that are my followers, my disciples, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Christ, brothers and sisters, do you believe in Jesus? He wants your life to shine. He wants you to be a good forgiver. He wants you to be slow to anger. He wants you to throw away grudges and bitterness. He wants you to start living for love instead of living for money or popularity and all these other things. And when we do that, our lives will look different and jesus wants all of his people to look different in the way we live he says nor does anyone hide uh, light a lamp and then put it on your basket what's the point of that why why would you get saved and then hide your life but put it on a lampstand and it gives light to all who are in the house when we live our life for jesus we will bring light to the people around us let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify God who is in heaven. Brothers and sisters, if you're living for Jesus, you are God's walking billboard. You are God's advertisement campaign. He's drawing people to himself through you. Now, now it gets interesting. Matthew, well, that's already interesting. Matthew chapter 5 from verse 17. Jesus said, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. God is not winking at the law and saying, you know what, that Old, that old Testament, all that stuff, it doesn't really matter anymore. No. Christ said, don't even think it. I didn't come to abolish the law. I'm here to fulfill the law. Truly, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away. And there's so many different Christians thinking about this from... I even saw one guy saying, well, what does this mean till heaven and earth passes away? Is he talking about like something momentous happening like the cross? And so that's when heaven and earth of the Old Testament passed away. It gets pretty bizarre, right? Or is he talking about the physical heaven and earth? When the physical heaven and earth pass away, uh, what, what's he talking about here? Truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all of it is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same 
shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And then there's argument about this. Christian scholars say least in the kingdom of heaven, at least you get to heaven. Or the people in the kingdom of heaven will call you least and, and you didn't make it. And like I said, there's so many things going on here. But one thing I do see is this is serious. And I'm a pastor and I'm standing in front of you. And I better be very careful. Whoever annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. This is serious stuff. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Let me repeat that. I say to you, that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus says the law won't pass away. The law stands. It will always stand. What does this mean? Did you eat bacon this morning? Anybody eat bacon this week maybe? How about pepperoni pizza? Do you have any pepperoni or sausage? How about lobster? How about shrimp? Have you ever in your life worked on a Saturday? Have you ever worn any clothes with two kinds of thread both used in it? In the Old Testament, you were not allowed to. The law says you can't. Have you kept all of the Jewish holy days? Don't lie to me. I know you haven't because the temple's gone. Have you been making regular Old Testament sacrifices as the law requires? Oh, yes, there is no temple, so you couldn't. So what do we make of this? Because we're either bound by this law, in which case we're all doomed, because we can't make a sacrifice there, or a different sacrifice has been made for us. I want to take Christ's words at face value here. I don't believe that Christ came to do away with the law. I don't believe that at all. I believe the law stands until the very end. The law stands. And you know why I think that? Because if the law didn't stand, then people today wouldn't need to put their faith in Jesus because there would be no law. They would not be guilty before the law. The law still stands, and the law demands perfection. Nothing has been done to put away the law. Brothers and sisters, are you following me? The law still stands. I think the clue, we, well, the clue for this interpretation is right here in the context. The opening salvo on human self-righteousness is found in the Beatitudes. And then here in verse 17, again, look at verse 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have, come, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Christ was about to do what everybody sitting there. Everybody sitting there knew, I, I don't measure up. I don't measure up. And Christ says, what you can't do, I'm going to do. I will fulfill. I will fulfill. Nobody in the Old Testament, nobody who's ever lived, has ever perfectly fulfilled the entire righteous law of God. And Christ said, I will do that. And, and uh, if we had more time, uh, St. Augustine went through seven ways that Christ fulfilled the law. I thought it was really beautiful, really interesting. Uh, but... Christ fulfilled the law in, in, in many ways. He was morally perfect. He fulfilled the law. He was the sacrifice for us, fulfilling the Old Testament sacrificial system. In many other ways, he was also fulfilling the law. Christ did what we could not do. Christ didn't come and throw away the test. Christ didn't come and throw away the test. He came to answer the test. He didn't come to deny the debt. We have a moral debt. He didn't come to deny the debt. He came to pay the debt. He didn't come to throw away God's law or abrogate the law. He came to fulfill the law. So that's why I can't, I can't buy any of those things that Christ set aside the law, Christ abrogated the law. If that was true, then nobody would be guilty today. The law still stands. Christ said it still stands, and I believe it. I'm taking him at face value. And just in case, just in case you're still worried about eating pepperoni pizza or lobster this afternoon, or you're worried that your coat has different kinds of thread in it, uh, let me quickly read to you, and this is a little bit of a rabbit trail, but let me quickly read to you from Mark, uh, Matthew, Mark uh, 7 and 14 through 23, quickly. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, 
Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside of you can defile you by going into you. Rather, it is what that comes out of you that defiles you. After he had said, after he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him, asked him about this parable, parable. He said, are you so dull? Uh, that's funny. Christ said, are you so dull? He asked him, don't you see that nothing that enters you from the outside can defile you? For it doesn't, for, for it do, doesn't it go into your heart and into your stomach and then, yes, then you have to go potty. Exactly. That's exactly what Christ is saying here. It goes into your stomach and then it's expelled. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. Then he went on. What comes out of you is what defiles you for what, uh, what is from within. For from within, out of your heart comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All of these evils come from inside of you and, and defile you. So Christ is saying it comes from what comes out of you, the words you say, the thoughts that you think, the actions you do, those are, are what makes us uh, defiled, not the food that we eat from the outside. The, Mark says uh, Jesus declared that all food is is uh, okay. Uh, so that's apparently not the issue, but we still see that uh, Christ is saying we have to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees, and it's about to get worse. It's about to get worse. Christ goes after his listeners' very last hope. If there was anybody there that still had a hope of being declared righteous by saying, oh, I guess I'm better than the Pharisees. They're jerks anyways. Christ goes right after those people uh, by, by taking away their last hope that they could be good according to the law. Listen to what comes next. Matthew 5, 21 through 26. You have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you, isn't that bizarre? You've heard what the Old Testament says. And he's standing in front of thousands of people. You've heard what the Old Testament says, Leviticus. But I say to you, he's setting himself up in a position to, well, it's just amazing. But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you empty head, which is what rock, uh, you empty head shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. I wonder what the crowd thought. I wonder what the crowd thought. I wonder how many... I wonder how many moms who had called their kids fools, you know. I wonder how many, how many men who had called somebody else a fool. What did they think about this point? This teacher, this, this young radical teacher says, you call somebody a fool, you call somebody an empty head, fires of hell for you. Fire of hell for you. You have heard it said, but I say, Jewish rabbis would interpret scripture the way pastors do today. We look at the scriptures and we try to glean from it what God has for us. But Jesus went beyond that. He took it upon himself to enhance scripture, to add depth to scripture, to add nuance to scripture. Who is this guy? And that's the question the people had to have been asking on that hillside. Who is this guy? Who does he think he is? And what, how is he so confident to say that law that I'm telling you right now you don't fulfill? I fulfill it. I'm going to fulfill it. Matthew 5, 27 through 30. You have heard it said you should not commit adultery. And I'm getting... A lot of people started to squirm at that point. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And there wasn't a man left in that crowd who felt like he could fulfill the law anymore. Shot down. Christ just shot him down. You fail, you fail, you fail, you fail. Before the law of God, we fail. Matthew 5, 31 and 32. He said, Whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. Again, a quote right out of the Old Testament. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except for the reasons of unchastity makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman, woman commits adultery. Christ is making it hard, isn't he? Matthew 5, 33-37. Again, you have heard that the ancients were told you shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. Yeah, that's true, right? Nobody can argue with that. But I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. 
But let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond that is evil. Now, some people have said, look at this. He's abrogating the law of divorce. He's abrogating the law of adultery. He's abrogating the laws. I don't think so. He's not setting aside the law. He's saying, listen, you didn't even begin to imagine how onerous the law is. How you didn't even begin to understand how perfect the law is. Even thinking wrong makes us guilty of the law. Some people really make a big deal about this passage, and maybe you're one of those, about uh, don't make a vow, don't make a promise. But I think that's really missing the point. And again, you can disagree with me. I'm, I'm a big boy. People disagree with me all the time. Uh, I don't think, uh, see, Jesus said, people say, Jesus said we should never make promises. We should never swear in court or, 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 or swear that our words are true. I think that's really missing the point. Jesus is saying, you guys who follow me, my followers, the people who are living according to the Beatitudes that are broken by the sin and now they're trying to live by this better standard, everything that my people say, everything they say is a promise. He's not saying don't make a promise. He's saying every word you say is a promise. It should all be true. You don't have to say a, a vow. I swear on the capital of Washington, D.C., or I swear on my father's grave. No. Everything you say should be true. Your yes should mean yes. Your no should mean no. So he's, he's not telling us don't make a vow. He's saying everything you say is a promise. Let's keep uh, reading about this radical faith now and radical lifestyle that Christ is teaching those who, who follow him to obey. Uh, Matthew 5, 38 through 48. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. And uh, I've heard a lot of people who are not Christians say that this moral, morality Christ teaching is unlivable. Therefore, it's ridiculous. And I've heard Christians say, this is so difficult. Maybe Christ thought that the second coming was going to come right after, and so it was okay to live this way because the second coming was going to come soon. Christ didn't know at that time that there'd be this thousands of years interval. Uh, and then I find myself and other Christians trying to make excuses for why this really doesn't say what it says, and I keep coming back to this feeling in my stomach that if I'm trying to make excuses to avoid the Holy Spirit, maybe I'm not letting this sermon do what it's supposed to do. Maybe it's supposed to be convicting. And maybe when we read this, we're supposed to say, yeah, this is what God's standards are, and I'm not measuring up. And if we make excuses for it and say, this is really not what it means to say, we're taking the punch out of the Sermon on the Mount. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go a mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you and do not turn away those who want to borrow from you. I, I failed at these things. You have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. See, I think this is... If, if the non-Christians are saying this can't be, this is a crazy moral. And if Christians are finding excuses to explain why it really doesn't mean what it says, something comes to my mind and said, wow, if the non-Christians don't like it and the Christians don't like it, who wrote this? Maybe that's a good sign that this is supernatural because it comes across as so unnatural to me. This is something only God would say. Here's the kind of love I want you to have. I want you to love your enemies. Because Christ looked down at us, and we're all in rebellion. We're all doing our own thing. And we're saying, I don't have time for God. I'm going to do it my way. And God says, I love you, and I'm going to die for you. And then, if you love me, I want you to be like me. This is not natural. Remember I said this is radical and counterintuitive? This blows away the mirage of human righteousness. God is calling us to something better than ourselves. And that's why it's so beautiful. I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. You want to be like, your, like me? Jesus is saying, you want to be like your Father in heaven? Then love your enemies. Because God, the Father, causes the sun to rise on evil people and good people. And he sends rains on the righteous and the unrighteous. 
Be good to people who treat you bad. Do you have anybody in mind who's treated you pretty badly? Maybe a coworker, maybe a brother or sister, maybe even somebody at church? Love that person. Pray for him. Because God loves us when we've been in rebellion to him. Verse 46, for if you love those who love you, what reward is there for that? You don't have to be a follower of Jesus to love people who, who treat you well. Do not even tax collectors do the same. And that's kind of unfair to the whole profession of the IRS, but, but that's right there in Scripture, so I've got to go with it. Uh, he says, don't even, like, like, these people, the tax collectors in that, in that culture would take advantage of people, but even self-centered tax collectors like the people who treated them well, Christ says, you don't get any reward for liking people who treat you well. I want you to love people who treat you badly. I want you to love people who mistreat you. If you only greet your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And this is, brings us right back to where we started today. The standard is perfection. The law cannot be ignored. The law is not set aside. The sacrifices mandated for sinners must be made. It needs to be fulfilled. Leviticus 19.2, Deuteronomy 18.13. God says, you must be holy as I am holy, and God hasn't changed. Are you a sinner? Let's start with weeping and mourning our sin. The way the Sermon on the Mount starts with, because there is no hope in here, and there is hope when we put our faith on Jesus Christ. Christ has fulfilled the righteous requirements of the law in a way that we cannot. Jesus is telling us who he is. He's also telling us who we are. And he's also telling us, and here's how I want my people to be. You should be different. Brothers and sisters, Foundation Church, we should be loving each other and forgiving each other in such a way that it's like a light on a hill, like a city on a hill, like a light on a lampstand. Let's live different. Let's have different values, different hopes, different dreams, different ways of treating people. Jesus says, this is how I want my people to live. Do you trust me? Then live this way. Let your light shine. Don't excuse our attitudes because our actions are okay. Well, I haven't committed adultery, but I can let run in my head whatever I want. No. Actions and heart matter to God. He wants his children to not only do right, but also to think right. We have an idea that a meaningful Christian life is about being. Sometimes do you get this feeling that having a really, I want to have a meaningful life. I want to do something big. I, I want to be a missionary or, or a church planner or a, a famous Christian artist or a, a Christian athlete. Then I could have a platform to speak or, or a Christian singer and, and have thousands of people leading into worship and Maybe, maybe we think that only Christians who give their life caring for leopards or street kids or prostitutes or who die for their faith, only those people are really, really living for Christ. Now listen, those are great things. I love my Christian brothers and sisters who are out there doing things for the Lord. Some people right in this room may be doing those things or will be involved in doing those things. But this famous Sermon on the Mountainside, this incredibly beautiful sermon that Christ gives, for how his people should think, how they should believe, how they should act. Christ is talking about radical, subversive, unexpected, counterintuitive faith that can be lived right out in Milton, Edgerton, James, Wisconsin. By regular people like you and me, we can live the way Christ has called us to, totally different than the way the world lives. And we don't need to do all those other good things that some people are called to but we can be radical for Jesus right at Woodman's. We can be radical for Jesus wherever your job is. You can be radical for Jesus on whatever street you live on. You can be radical for Jesus in your family. And that's the beauty of this message that Christ has called us to. So the law stands. Christ has fulfilled the law. Uh, the way we get right with God, we're broken by our sin. Christ says, here's the way I want you to live. You trust me and say, yes, I, want, I trust you. And we follow after him. And uh, it's not signing our name on a piece of paper saying, I prayed the right prayer, I believed the right thing, but it's showing a life of faith by saying, I agree, God's ways are better than mine, and I want to follow after him and live his way. And Christ very much knew that the people who did it, that and signed up for that, they were his people. Later, we're going to see why that can all be true, because of the cross. 
because of the cross. And, Jesus, and uh, Paul, among others, is going to explain that for us. But today, what we need to know is that uh, we can all come to faith in Jesus Christ because he's fulfilled what we couldn't. Let's bow right now in, uh, and just say a few short words of prayer. Dear Lord God, while uh, you did a miracle today, I saw so many faces were alert and uh, paying attention. Thank you, God, uh, for being here this morning. Father, I pray, Lord, uh, that we didn't miss the teaching of your scripture, that we didn't miss the mark. Uh, Father, help us all to really uh, take this message to heart, uh, that your message, the Sermon on the Mount, Lord, and not to try to make excuses for why it doesn't apply to me, to us, Lord. But, Father, help us to live out radically different lives, lives of love and forgiveness and caring for others the way you've called us to be, God. And please help us to be different. We want to be like a city on a hill, shining out uh, that here's a, here's a place to find grace. Here's a place to find love. Here's a place to find truth and beauty. Lord God, please let these things be true in our lives as individuals, and please let these things be true in our church. We pray this all in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.